It started in China. It's a made in China crisis. The coronavirus pandemic began in China. It peaked, then it subsided. For the past five days, very few new cases are being reported in China. Temporary hospitals are being folded up. Emergency workers are being sent home. <laughs> So China is recovering, but the rest of the world is struggling. There are more than 200,000 cases worldwide now. The figure has doubled in two weeks. More than 8,000 people have died. More than 82,000 people have recovered. China had almost half of the global cases, more than 81,000, 3,200 deaths. Now China's numbers are falling, but elsewhere the death toll is mounting, the disease is spreading and China is to blame. This is a Chinese virus. Tonight, we'll give you four reasons why. One, China ignored reports of the virus for weeks when it was first reported. Two, China targeted the whistleblowers. Three, China destroyed test samples of patients. And four, China lied to the world about how serious the situation is. Had China been transparent about the coronavirus outbreak, the world would have had a head start in containing this epidemic. The hashtag, China lied, people died, is trending and there's merit to it. On this show tonight, we will show you evidence of China's cover-up. This report has been prepared after days of research and backed up by several international publications of repute. This is the story of the Chinese pandemic. The first cases trickled into Wuhan's hospitals almost three months ago. This was in December 2019. According to some reports, the first case of coronavirus emerged way back in November. Patients complained of dry coughs, high fevers and breathlessness. When lung scans were carried out, they showed something different. This was not your usual pneumonia. The patients continued to get more sick and more people became infected. The virus was spreading. But authorities looked the other way. A. Fen, the director of Wuhan Central Hospital, decided to carry out some tests. And her account was later published in China News Weekly. It's a Chinese magazine. The tests came back by the end of December. The results indicated a SARS-like coronavirus, a new disease that was rapidly spreading in Wuhan. Other doctors began reporting similar cases. One of them was Dr. Li Wenliang. This is the man on your screens. He noticed the early reports. Dr. Li was an ophthalmologist at the Wuhan Central Hospital. He was alarmed by what he saw. He was one of the first whistleblowers. He warned his colleagues about the outbreak over WeChat. WeChat is a social media platform much like WhatsApp that we use in India. Guess who read his messages on WeChat? China's internet police. The censors are everywhere in China. They read what you post. Dr. Li was summoned by the police in Wuhan. He was accused of spreading lies and rumors, targeted for speaking the truth. Dr. Li died last month in February. He continued treating coronavirus patients as the government continued to target him. By now, it was well established that there was a disease outbreak in Wuhan. There were several patients and authorities had collected several samples. Researchers were carrying out tests and Beijing had been informed. They knew what was going on and that is when the cover-up begins. On the 1st of January this year, an employee of a genomics company reportedly received a phone call from an official. This is a very important turn. This company was involved in the testing of the coronavirus samples. The Hubei Provincial Health Commission ordered them to stop the testing. Stop the testing. They were asked to destroy all existing samples. You heard that right. Destroy the samples, bury the proof of an outbreak. Two days later, on the 3rd of January, China's National Health Commission ordered all institutions to not publish any information. Labs were ordered to transfer any samples that they had or destroy them. But this outbreak was too big to hide. Six days later, China had to admit that it was dealing 
with the Wuhan coronavirus outbreak. So to sum it up, when the disease was detected, China refused to acknowledge it. When concerns were raised, China tried to silence voices. When proof was provided, China destroyed it. Beijing knew about the outbreak, but it suppressed the facts and let the virus spread. When countries around the world tried to impose travel restrictions or issue warnings, China lashed out at them. China said that they were spreading panic. When Chinese citizens faced scrutiny outside, China said that they were victims of racism. When the world demanded accountability, China said that the virus was an American import. For weeks, Chinese diplomats have been churning out propaganda. They're pushing conspiracy theories. They're trolling critics and blaming the US for this outbreak. The Wuhan coronavirus could have been stopped, but Beijing's cover-up unleashed a pandemic on the world. see what, what's going on. Um, what do you see today in terms of whether you think we're close or at a, a, a bottom and it's time to maybe put some money to work? Although I, I hate to even pose the question that way because it's so uncertain. No one knows what the true bottom is, though you've had some names come on the air and say you, you've got to if you're in this for the long term. Yeah, Scott, I wanted to come on today because I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot I wanted to sort of get off my chest, but let me start with um, what I think has been apparently obvious psychologically over the last few days, and you've heard it from basically all of your guests, either explicitly or implicitly, which is that they have been so whipsawed that they are so coiled for a rally. And everybody is talking the language of a rally, and everybody, I think, wants to see a rally happen, and whenever there's even an iota of even moderately good news, the market reacts just because it has been um, so whipped around. Now, if you take a step back, let me give you a, the bull case on what we're learning. And I think we should start with the science because that's the most important thing. Three or four weeks ago, there was emerging evidence on the value of chloroquine and remdesivir as treatment even prophylactically for coronavirus. We saw that coming out of China. It's largely now built up enough clinical validation where what happened today I think was very important. Up until today, the CDC, if you went to the website, had literally zero guidance on the efficaciousness of these two drugs, um, either in treatment or prophylactically if you think you're getting symptoms. And that's an important shift because it starts to change our posture away from the perfect towards the good and not letting perfect being the enemy of the good. And this is something that we were saying for a while, which is that if you relax some of these hyper strict standards that the CDC and FDA had, what it would allow doctors the possibility of doing and scientists the ability to do is to tell us in a projective way what could happen and allow folks to be more um, aggressive in the types of protocols they use that get that information out broadly. It should not be the case that you have to go to YouTube for ventilators to learn, you know, for, for anesthesiologists, et cetera, to describe how to string ventilators together. That's not what should be happening. We need government institutions to be at the uh, tip of the spear here in making sure we understand what's happening. So I think that was a good thing. And I think that if we can get broad-based understanding of the value of these drugs in the hands of as many doctors and frankly the population at large as possible to know that there are remedies that work for an overwhelmingly large part of the population that should be very reassuring but then it shifts to what i think the next thing is we have to do you know there's this very famous churchill quote winston churchill quote about the united states which is that you know the united states will do the right thing after it has tried everything else and this is where we need to prove that wrong we are still sort of, you know, in the queue of trying to ramp up our testing mechanisms if you have an acute onset of coronavirus. So this is these, you know, PCR tests that we've heard a lot about. But if you want to see a rally, if people are indeed calling the bottom, there is one thing and one thing only that we can do, which is we need to have broad-based testing of antibodies. So let me just explain this so everybody knows what's going on. There's a lot of data coming out of China, 
and now also coming out of South Korea, that seems to indicate that there are large, broad bases of spreader populations who are asymptomatic, meaning mostly young people, probably, who are walking around feeling not sick at all or very, very slightly sick, and they are the ones that are driving the infectious rate up here. But what that also means is that they may have also recovered and could be advancing us to a point of herd immunity. The only way we can know if that is true is to buy a different kind of test, and these tests are pennies. They're made in China. They're called IgG and IgM antibody tests. If we could get tens or hundreds of millions, we could ask the National Guard, or we could ask, you know, for us to use the voting infrastructure we have in the 50 states for people to get tested. And the reason why that's important is that if it looks like there are millions or tens of millions of people who are expressing this antibody, we have a huge denominator. It means that the severity of this disease is not what we think. And a lot of us can get back to work, which is probably the next critical thing. That's if you believe the bull case. Whether you believe it or not, I think we're at a point in time now where that the government does need to act. You know, it's taken us three weeks to get to chloroquine and remdesivir as a government-endorsed statement. I hope it doesn't take three weeks for us to realize that we should be testing every man, woman, and child in the United States for these antibodies. Because the faster we understand how prevalent this disease has been, the faster we can get to this rally that everybody wants. Do, do you, are you a believer in the bull case you lay out or not? I think that if you read the science right now, there is a very good chance. I would put that at about 30%. So a one in three chance, which is why it's a bet worth taking, that what we have is something that is broadly being infectiously spread largely by young people in an asymptomatic fashion. They are doing it unwittingly and unknowingly. And because it doesn't affect them that much, and because the, the effects of this travel upstream in the age distribution histogram, they're not thinking that much of it. Now, that's not to blame them. They don't know. But testing for these antibodies would allow us to definitively understand whether this is true. Of course. Well, that's, it, why, that's, why, will, that's why South Korea was at such an advanced stage of their testing and their, you know, quote unquote recovery uh, than we were is because they were able to identify early on through testing in magnitudes that we still haven't reached who to isolate and to stop these super spreads of the, the likes of which you, you're, you're talking about. Let me ask you quick, because I don't, I don't have a, a whole ton of time, Jamath. Um, the corporate world's gonna look a lot different on, on the other side of this. I think, I think we know that. As, as somebody who sits on boards of companies, as somebody who invests in company, companies and believes in the future generation of leadership in, in this country, how, how is this gonna look on the other side? What boards are able to do, what CEOs are able to do, uh, buybacks and dividends and the, yeah. all the like. Two, yeah. Two things. Um, I think we need to talk about companies and we need to talk about hedge funds. On the company side, you know, the CEOs of companies and compensation committees of most boards have been engaged in a game. And this game is all about working compensation around earnings per share. And even when earnings would not naturally go up, they were able to juice earnings per share by reducing share counts. They did that by getting levered and doing buybacks. That enriched CEOs, it enriched board directors, and it enriched the hedge funds that activated for those changes. That's all it helped. And the problem with that is that now we have a whole bunch of companies who you know, frittered away tens and hundreds of billions of dollars on buybacks when they should have been saving it for a rainy day, investing it in R&D, or doing something that was much more important than what they did. There needs to be consequences for those actions. The second is that when you look at the hedge fund industry, a lot of why there's so much volatility right now is because these hedge funds are massively levered. You know, you heard earlier about risk parity funds blowing up. These are not funds that are trading billions of dollars, Scott. When you go to a prime broker with 25 or $30 billion of treasury security, they're allowing you to lever that up 10, 12, 13x in the case of some of these hedge funds. $100 billion funds running trillions of dollars of notional exposure. 
and they are completely roiling the capital markets. They are turning around and turning upside down people's 401ks and people's pensions, driving companies down 70% when they maybe should only be down 30%. Somebody needs to answer for that volatility. After 2008, the bank's hands were slapped. They were handcuffed. They were told how to operate. But in return, what they did, all of the very aggressive practices on leverage, they just put off balance sheets. And who took it up? The hedge funds. And in these last 10 years, what do you see? Hedge fund guys are the ones buying quarter billion dollar apartments. Hedge fund guys are the ones buying sports teams. Hedge fund guys are the ones uh, buying art. And now all of a sudden, if we have to go and step into the capital markets with United States dollars that everybody has a right to as citizens of this country, to shore up the financial operations of the capital markets, somebody has to pay a price for that as well. You know, not a single person went to jail in 2008 in, in, in Wall Street and in that financial mechanism. And in return, what happened was Main Street was decimated, the opioid crisis was created, the wealth gap was exacerbated. You can't go through this again. But where, where, were, where were voices like this at, at the height of the, the bull market? Why are we only talking about this when, when we're, we're Scott, talking after we're st not, stocks collapsed? Hold on. Wait, we're not even talking about it now. You and I are talking about it. There's not a single hedge fund that wants to sit there and admit that their prime broker is giving them seven, eight, nine turns of leverage because volatility was low. And now that volatility is high, they're degrossing and delevering every day in these violent swings. And you layer on quant funds, you layer on ARP funds, you layer on macro funds, and all these folks were running business models to try to eke out basis points multiplied by huge leverage so that they could make current compensation. And yet again, because the Fed steps in, yet again, because the prime brokers tell the Fed, we cannot shut these markets down, Main Street will have to bail everybody out. Well, look, there's the, the president just a moment ago said that he supports the U.S. taking equity stakes in companies that it aids. Not enough. He, he, was, asked, Not enough. he was asked earlier whether he would support um, legislation or in this in the stimulus plans, no bonuses and and no buybacks. Uh, he seemed to suggest that he would at least in that moment. Whether he does in the broader sense and when it comes down to it, uh, who knows? But but God, it's that, not that cry is out there. That not that's not enough. You can't just hold a CEO accountable after making four hundred million dollars over the last ten years to all of a sudden take no bonus or to claw back $10 million of bonus. Let me tell you something. When I, I've gone through four of these uh, cataclysmic economic cycles in my lifetime, okay? In two of them, I was poor. I grew up on welfare, above a laundromat, family of five in a 300 square foot apartment. I had nothing. Those two events did not change my life because I started with nothing and I had nothing at the end of it. These last two cycles, I found myself on the other opposite end of the spectrum, and for, for all intents and purposes, not that much change. The people that get decimated are the 80% in the middle, and we have a responsibility this time around to learn from what we did wrong the last time. You can't just bail folks out financially for being financially greedy. It's unfair. And what we did in 2008 was incomplete. All we did was shift risk off balance sheet. And in that, what we are now in the middle of is this incredible whipsaw up and down every day, which is driving psychology, which is driving behavior that is, in my opinion, unproductive. And so, you know, we have the president of the United States in many ways, I think, on his heels trying to react to markets. We have the Treasury Secretary trying to react to markets. But they're reacting to a market that isn't necessarily trading directionally correctly. It's a bunch of folks who are massively levered up in a low vol environment, going through an incredibly difficult, violent unwind. I, I hear that you. has nothing to do with anything. I, I hear and you. I, look, I, think I, 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 I wish this some time of the, around, the, Scott. But, but hold at on, some, at this some time point. around, you have to pin these guys down. You can't let them run this lever. But at you some can't. at some point. You, you can't have an 08 happen and, and, and a year, months, whatever, later say this is what should have happened. Nobody ever says at the moment that everybody's, you know, parting like it's 1999, 
that the, the system's broken. That it's only after the fact, and that's what we're finding ourselves doing yet again. And it, it's going to be a conversation um, of the moment, and it's going to last for a long time. And maybe, maybe that's a good thing, but it, it, it would really be nice if these voices were heard when when the Dow is looking like it's going to hit thirty thousand, and the Nasdaq Scott, looks like it's going to hit ten thousand. Scott, the problem is these things are not known. It's not as if there's a report that says X Y Z hedge fund is running thirteen times or XYZ other hedge fund is running 25 times. You don't know these things. It's only in moments like this that that data leaks out because the risk groups inside these funds talk, the traders inside these funds talk, they're all going through pain together, and this is when the information happens. So my point is, we know now that it wasn't two or three turns of leverage that these folks were running. It is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 times in some cases. It is long-term capital management writ large playing out in prime time now every day in the market and my point to you is we now have a responsibility we didn't know ltcm before 98 happened we knew it after but we had a responsibility to act 08 happened we reacted to the banks and what i'm telling you is the banks shifted risk off balance sheet we know where the bodies are buried now it is 2020 march we know what to do and so along with whatever bailout we do, all of these trillions of dollars that have stepped into the capital markets right now to shore up what's going on needs to come at a price. And the American people have a right to demand that you cannot run leverage this way. Because well, these exogenous facts, these externalities will happen more and more over time. And we are not prepared. It is clear that the markets cannot handle these kinds of events and that we were too optimistic, and we don't deserve to be given this much leverage. It's like giving a baby a loaded gun. Jamath, I'm, I'm going to leave it there.